In this video, we are going to discuss arrangement of electrons around the nucleus of an atom, and we're also going to learn about ions. Now, an atom is made up of proton, electrons, and neutrons. The protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and electrons are hovering around the nucleus. Now, electrons are distributed in what's called shells or orbitals, and each shell can hold a defined number of electrons. In this class, we only care about the first three shells, and each shell holds, as mentioned, a defined number of electrons. The first shell, which is closest to the nucleus, holds up to two electrons. The second shell holds up to eight electrons, and the third shell holds up to eight electrons. And a way to remember this is to think of it like this, 288, eight, with two being closest to the nucleus. And then eight is the second one, and eight is the third one. So what are electron shells? So let's think of a carbon atom. We are going to, with a carbon, a carbon, it's going to have an atomic number of six and atomic mass, I'm going to round this up, so atomic mass of 12. Okay, so then let me change the color of my pen. Right? So we're going to, uh, carbon is going to have a nucleus in which there's going to be six protons. And how many neutrons do we have? Well, we know the atomic mass is number of protons plus number of neutrons. And if we have six protons, then there should also be six neutrons. Now, since we're talk talking about a neutral atom of carbon, the atomic number also represents the number of electrons. So there are six electrons. So where do they go? The first two go on the first shell. And we got four more left. They're going to go to the fourth shell. Now I'm drawing these, and most of the drawing that you see in textbooks and things like that, we, you see electrons moving on a straight line. But actually this is not how it happens. This is just done for simplicity, for us to be able to easily account for the number of electrons and when, where they are positioned. So if we were going to actually draw this properly, this would be the nucleus, and I'm gonna skip the proton and neutron, and the way we draw the position of the electron would be kind of a cloud like this. So this would be the first shell. But why do we do it like this? Because electrons really, as scientists cannot really be sure at any one point the exact location of an electron. So really an orbital, which is represented here, which looks like the solar system, but it actually is not, you can, if you think about the atom as a sphere, this would be, the nucleus would be center of the sphere, and this would be a space, um, some distance from the center of the sphere, this would be the space. So the reason I'm wiggling like this, because we really don't know the exact location of an electron. So really an orbital, is a statement of the probability of finding electrons in there. So then when we talk about an orbital, we're really not talking about a defined path. It's a, it's a probability. It's a space in which there is probability of finding electrons. So in the first orbital, <clears throat> there is a probability of finding a maximum of two electrons. 
The same thing happens for the other orbitals, but they don't have really spherical shapes. They could, they could be either spherical spaces or they could be dumbbell shaped like that, but we don't worry about that. Don't worry about this. Just remember that when we draw the orbitals as straight lines, it's really not a straight line. This is just for ease of representation. They are actually, electron shells are actually spaces around a nucleus, a particular distance from a nucleus, in which there is a probability of finding electrons. So that's what an electron shell is. So let's again look at review uh, atom of carbon. The atomic number is 6, mass number is 12. So here's the nucleus, 6 protons, 6 neutrons. How many electrons do we have in the first shell? We got 2. How many electrons do we have in the second shell? We have 4. So now we're going to move on to the concept of ions. Now atoms are most stable when they fill their outermost shell with electrons. So what does that mean? That atoms, in general, in nature, the tendency is to go towards the most stable state. And the most stable state for an atom is one in which the outer electron shell is full. So let's take a look at sodium and chlorine. In sodium, there are two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell, and one electron in the last shell. Now, for sodium to be in its most stable state, you'd think that, okay, it's going to need seven more electrons, but that takes a tremendous amount of energy and resources for this atom to gain seven more electrons. It actually, it's easier for sodium, the path of the least resistance for sodium to get to a stable state, to an ideal state, is just to let go of this one. So when sodium lets go of this one, then it's going to have an outer shell that is complete. Well, what about chlorine? Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. So in order to have a complete outer shell, it just needs one more. It's not really um, energetically favorable to lose all these seven electrons. It's just more elect energetically favorable to gain a new electron and have a complete outer shell and be at the most stable state. So when this happens, when sodium loses an electron, it gains a positive charge. You see the last shell, is empty and we sh actually it shouldn't be drawn in here anymore because we said these shells represent a possibility of finding an electron in this area but there is no electron to hang around here so we actually should be getting rid of this one but now the important point is that sodium is losing an electron and now it doesn't have the total electrons that a neutral sodium atom had. So then there is one, two, that's 10 electrons here. And in the nucleus, sodium have 11 protons. So there is one more positive charge. Therefore, the sodium has a positive charge when it loses an electron. The chlorine now gains the electron and it has one extra electron. Therefore, it gains a negative charge. Now, in this case, we have ions. We have a sodium ion that has one positive charge and a chloride ion that has one negative charge. So again, in a native state, an atom is neutral. Remember, we said that in an uncharged atom, number of protons are equal to number of electrons. But a atom becomes an ion when it either loses or gains an electron. So here's some examples of ions. So aluminum has uh, three positive charges. That means it has lost three electrons. 
chloride has gained one electron, sodium has lost one electron, and magnesium has lost two electrons. So these are all ions. So when an atom loses an electron, what will the net charge be on the resulting ion? Well, it loses one electron, then the net charge is going to be plus one. When an atom gains an electron, what is the net charge on the ion? It's going to be negative one because there's one extra electron. Now let's visualize ion formation in a different way. So here's we have sodium has 11 protons. Okay. So we are going to write up, instead of writing it in a circle, I'm going to draw these on a straight line. So you can see why this change of charge happens. So I'm going to draw 11 protons. Now this is a neutral sodium atom, so therefore it would have equal number of electrons. So you see there is a balance between positive charges and negative charges. So these, all of these are canceled out, okay? Now I'm not going to draw the last one, but this is also going to be neutralizing. But now imagine that sodium loses one electron. Let's lose this electron. So what happens? All of these have been neutralized, but now we have one less electron. So therefore, what is the positive, what is the charge? It's positive one. But let's imagine, for some reason, sodium would lose, it's not going to, but let's just for purpose, for argument purposes, that sodium loses two electrons. Now we have two positive charges. Let's say it loses three electrons. Now we have three positive charges, okay? Now, it's really important to realize that during ion formation, the atoms do not lose protons. If an atom either adds or loses protons, it becomes a completely different atom. What happens during ion formation is that the atom is gains or loses an electron. So I hope this helped uh, you visualize why we get a positive charge when we lose an electron um, and why, how, how, where the numbers come from. So now let's do an example, just for argument's sake, that now we gain an electron. Oops, this electron is pretty huge, but forgive it. It doesn't mean anything. The sign doesn't mean anything. So these are all crossing one another, but let's say this atom gains an electron. Now it has one negative charge, so it has a charge of negative one. What if it gains two electrons? That's the sign, electric charge of negative two. What if it gains three electrons? That's a negative charge of three. So here's a table for you to sit down and work this out. And not only I would uh, advise you to complete this table, but also draw the electron structure diagram for the ion. Um, and also do it for the neutral one and compare them. The best way you can learn this is just by practicing. Here's another one. So in this one, this is a negatively charged ion. And here we have a positively charged ion. So complete these exercises and come to discussion and check your work.